All right, so when I went to Harvard, I came from McGill, and I had spent a lot of time with my advisor there and, and a research team that he had trying to understand the genesis of antisocial behavior and it, among adolescents mostly. So, well, as kids as well, it's, antisocial behavior is very persistent. So if you have a child who's conduct disordered at the age of four, the probability that they will be criminal at the age of 15 or 20 is extremely high. It's unbelievably stable. It's a very dismal literature because you see these early onset aggressive kids and, and it's persistent. And then you look at the intervention literature and you throw up your hands because no interventions work. And believe me, psychologists have tried everything you could possibly imagine and a bunch of things that you can't in order to ameliorate that. So we were really interested in trying to understand, for example, if you're antisocial by the age of four, then there isn't an intervention that seems to be effective. So, and the, the standard penological theory is really quite horrifying in this regard, because what you see is that male aggression peaks around the age of 15, and then it declines fairly precipitously and, and, and sort of normalizes again by the age of 27. And standard penological theory essentially is this cold-hearted. It's like if you, have a multi, if you have someone who's a multiple offender, you just throw them in prison until they're 27. Then they age out of it. And that's all there is to it. That's, that's what we've got. Now, there's some downside to that because there's a corollary literature that suggests that the worst thing that you can do with antisocial people is to group them together, which is what we do in prisons. So, so that's a whole mess. Anyways, one of the things we were doing was trying to see if there might be cognitive predictors of antisocial behavior. And so we used this battery of neuropsychological tests that was put together at the Montreal Neurological Institute. It took about 11 hours to administer and hypothetically assess prefrontal cortical function. And we computerized that and reduced it to about 90 minutes and then um, assessed antisocial adolescents in, in Montreal and found out that they did show deficits in, in problem solving ability that we associated with, uh, with prefrontal ability. Um, when I got to Harvard, I thought, well, that's interesting. We could use the neuropsych battery to predict negative behavior. Perhaps we could use it to predict positive behavior. So I thought, well, what if we turned the neuropsych battery and, uh, over and thought, well, can we predict grades, for example? Because, you know, that's a decent thing to predict. So we ran a study, we ran a study that looked at Harvard kids, University of Toronto kids, line workers at a Milwaukee factory and managers and executives at the same factory. And what we found was that the average score across these neuropsychological tests, they were kind of like games. They were game-like, you know. So in one, in one test, you had, there were five lights in the middle of the screen and a box was associated with each light and you had to learn by trial and error which box was associated with, with each light. That was one of the tests. Uh, um, so we took people's average score across the tests because they seem to clump together into a single structure. You can, do, you can find that out statistically. If you take a bunch of tests, you can find out how they clump together statistically by looking at their patterns of correlations. And you might get multiple clumps, which is what happens with personality research where you get five, or you might get a singular clump, which is what happens in cognitive research. And we got a single clump, essentially. And then we were trying to figure out if at the same time, I was reading the literature on performance prediction. And there's an extensive literature on performance prediction, a lot of it generated by the armed forces, by the way, um, indicating that IQ is a very good predictor of long-term life success. And so here's the, here's the general rule. If your job is simple, which means you do the same thing every day, then IQ predicts how fast you'll learn the job, but not how well you, you do it. But if your job is complex, which means that the demands change on an ongoing basis, then the best predictor of success is general cognitive ability. And, uh, and I learned that the general cognitive ability tests clump together into a single factor. That's fluid intelligence or, or IQ. And then we didn't know if the factor that we had found was the same factor as IQ. And, it, and we still haven't really figured out whether or not that was the case because it kind of depends on how you do the analysis. But anyways, I, I got deeply into the performance prediction literature and I found out, well, if you wanted to predict people's performance in life, there's there's a couple of things you need to know. You need to know their general cognitive ability if they're going to do a complex job. 
You need to know their trait conscientiousness. Some of you might have heard that rebranded as grit in a very corrupt act, by the way, um, because it's a good predictor of long-term life success. Freedom from negative emotion, low neuroticism is another predictor, but it's sort of third on the hierarchy. And then openness to experience, which is a personality trait, is associated with, with expertise in creative domains. The evidence that, now I should tell you, since it's such a complicated question, I should tell you how to make an IQ test. Because it's actually really easy. And you need to know this to actually understand what IQ is. So imagine that you generated a, a set of 10,000 questions, okay, about anything. They could be math problems, they could be general knowledge, they could be vocabulary, they could be multiple choice. It really doesn't matter what they're about as long as they require abstraction to solve. So they'd be formulated linguistically, but mathematically would also apply. And then you have those 10,000 questions. Now you take a random set of a hundred of those questions and you give them to a thousand people. And all you do is sum up the answers, right? From so some people are going to get most of them right, and some, some of them are going to get most of them wrong. You just rank order the people in terms of their score. Correct that for age and you have IQ. That's all there is to it. And what you'll find is that no matter which random set of 100 questions you take, the people at the top of one random set will be at the top of all the others. And, and, and with very, very, very high consistency. So one thing you need to know is that if any social science claims whatsoever are correct, then the IQ claims are correct because the IQ claims are more psychometrically rigorous than any other phenomena, phenomenon that's been discovered by social scientists. Now, the IQ literature is a dismal literature. No one likes it. Here's why. Here's an example. So here's a, little, here's a fun little fact for you, for liberals and conservatives alike, because conservatives think there's a job for everyone if people just get off their asses and get to work. And liberals think, well, you can train anyone to do anything. It's like, no, there isn't a job for everyone. And no, you can't train everyone to do everything. That's wrong. And here's one of the consequences of that. So, as I mentioned, the Armed Forces has done a lot of work on IQ, and they started back in 1919. And the reason they did that was because, well, for obvious reasons, eh? let's say there's a war and you want to get qualified people into the officer positions as rapidly as possible, or you'll lose. So that's a reason. Now, the Armed Forces has experimented with IQ tests since 1919. And in the last 20 years, um, a law was passed as a consequence of that analysis, which was that it was illegal to induct anyone into the Armed Forces who had an IQ of less than 83. Now, the question is why? And the answer was, all of that effort put in by the armed forces indicated that if you had an IQ of 83 or less, there wasn't anything that you could be trained to do in the military that wasn't positively counterproductive. Now, you've got to think about that, eh? Because the military is chronically desperate for people, right? Then it's not like they're, it's not like people are lining up to be inducted, right? They have to go out and recruit, and it's not easy. And so they're desperate to get their hands on every body they can possibly manage. And then, especially in wartime, but also in peacetime. But then there was another reason too, which was the armed forces was also set up from a policy perspective to take people in the underclass, let's say, and train them and move them up at least into the working class or maybe the middle class. So there's a policy element to it too. And so even from that perspective, you could see that the military is desperate to bring people in. But you know, well, with an IQ of 83 or less, it's not happening. Okay, so how many people have an IQ of 83 or less? 10%. Now, if that doesn't if that doesn't hurt you to hear, then you didn't hear it properly. Because what it implies is that in a complex society like ours and one that's becoming increasingly complex, there isn't anything for 10% of the population to do. All right, well what are we going to do? We're going to ignore that? We're going to run away from that and uh, well, believe me, we have every reason to. Or are we going to contend with the fact that we need to figure out how it is, how it is, how it might be possible to find a place for people on the lower end of the general cognitive distribution to take their productive and, and worthwhile place in society. And that isn't just going to be a matter of dumping money down the hierarchy because giving people who have nothing to do money isn't helpful. It doesn't work. It's not that simple. Well. So that's kind of an answer to the question of whether or not we should deal with, uh, with IQ forthrightly.
like, if you can find a flaw in that logic, like just go right ahead. It's not like I was thrilled to death to discover all of this. By no, by no stretch of the imagination was that the case. So, so what? So IQ is reliable and valid. And that's the first thing. It's more reliable and valid than any other psychometric test ever designed by social scientists by a factor of about three. That's fact number one. Fact number two is it predicts long-term life outcome at about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, which leaves about 85%, 70 to 85% of the story unexplained, but it's still the best thing that we have. Well, it's also the case that in places like Great Britain, when IQ tests were first introduced, they were actually used by the socialists, and they were used to identify poor people who had potential, cognitive potential, and to move them into higher, into institutes of higher education. So there's an upside, you know, a social upside as well. Ethnic differences. One final thing to say about IQ. The ethnic differences are difficult to dispense with. It's not easy to make them go away. You can say, well, the tests aren't culture fair. Well, here's a test of that. So imagine you, you test group A with an IQ test and you test group B with an IQ test. And then you look at their actual performance in whatever you're predicting. If the test was biased against ethnic group A, then it would under predict their performance. And that doesn't happen. Now you could say, well, there's systemic bias in the performance measures and the potential measures. And that's a possibility. All right. Now, one other thing about that. There's a real danger in the ethnicity IQ debate. And the, the danger is that we confuse intelligence with value. Or that we include, we, we confuse intelligence with, yeah, with human value. That's a better way of thinking about it. And one of the things that we're going to have to understand here is that that's a mistake, is that being more intelligent doesn't make you a better person. That's not the case. It makes you more useful for complex cognitive operations. But you can be pretty damn horrific as a genius son of a bitch, right? It's morally neutral. And we also know that from the psychometric data, by the way. There doesn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever between intelligence and virtue. And so if it does turn out that nature and the fates do not align with our egalitarian presuppositions, which is highly probable. We shouldn't therefore make the mistake of assuming that if group A or person A is lower on one of these attributes than group B or person B, that that is somehow reflective of their intrinsic value as human beings. That's a big mistake. 